our study in 2 Samuel, be in chapter 16 tonight. If you've been tracking with us, David has trouble with his son Absalom. Absalom has designs on the kingdom and uh, has turned against his father. Didn't take Absalom very long once David kind of restored him back. Didn't take Absalom very long to start turning things over, turning against his father, and has really sought out to turn the people towards him instead of David, telling the people that, boy, if I was the judge or if I was in charge, you know, I'd treat you right. You know, it's the politician thing, telling the people what they want to hear so that they'll vote for you, you know. And that's Absalom's deal. That's what he did. And it worked pretty well. Uh, things haven't changed all that much, you know. If you tell people what they want to hear and promise them they'll have it, then generally speaking, they're going to go with you. And that's been working for thousands of years, you know. And again, uh, Absalom's been compared to a demagogue, you know, the kind of guy who tells people what they want because they know, you know, that the people are stupid. That's what a demagogue thinks. That's what a demagogue, that's what many people believe who run for office. They think that people are really dumb. And you know, sadly, <laughs> you know, we wonder, don't we, how some people stay in office even though people know exactly what they're all about? And, and isn't there some truth then to the belief that these politicians and others believe, like Absalom, that the people are kind of lame, kind of dumb. It's not that they're stupid. It's that they're greedy. What do you mean? I mean that when you tell people they can have what they want and they go for it, it's because they're self-centered and greedy. And you say, well, wait a minute. That's not why I vote for somebody. Bet it is. I'll bet you go for the guy who tells you what you want, you see. And oftentimes this is the case. And it's not because people are stupid. It's because people want what they want. And if a guy tells you, and we talked about this, oh, not too long. That was probably, well, it was probably a while back, I guess, actually. Time's flying. But, you know, around election time, remember? <laughs> we talked about some of these things. <clears throat> and if a politician stood there and, and, and on TV said, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm going to trust God to lead me. How many votes do you think you get? <laughs> you know, we've got a president who says, you know, inklings about his belief and his faith, and he gets condemned for it, you know. If you had a guy who just plain old told the truth and said, I have no clue how to fix the country, the economy, I don't know what's going on. But, you know, I'm going to pray a lot and see what the Lord does. <laughs> it's going to be adios amigo, you see. Because, nope, listen, people really don't want to hear the truth. If you tell people the truth, they're probably going to run you out of town. Well, you can ask the Apostle Paul. He was run out of town everywhere he went. Do you know why? He told the truth. Taught the truth, you see. Jesus, they crucified him for, for that, you see. So Absalom has worked the system well. He's got the people turning on David. And David has had to flee. And he had to leave Jerusalem. He took off. Remember, we looked at it last, last time about him going across the Kidron there the brook Kidron, and, and how it pictured Jesus, you know, going across that same brook on his way to the garden, you know, being turned on by his own. And Ahithophel, the counselor of David, has now changed sides, and he's on Absalom's side. And he is out for revenge against David because Ahithophel is the grandfather of Bathsheba. And he has had bitterness in his heart ever since David took advantage of her and had Uriah killed. And so he has turned now on David and wants nothing more than to see David wiped out. So this is kind of where we pick up the story. David's other counselor, 
uh, Hushai, who's a great guy. Hushai, the great guy. He's, he's a counselor that wanted to stay with David, and David convinced him, no, go. Join yourself with Absalom, and then you can kind of tell me what's happening. You see, you can confound Ahithophel and his counsel. You can kind of be an infiltrator for me. And so Hushai does this, as we'll see. Now, picking up the story in verse 1 of chapter 16. <clears throat> when David was a little uh, past the top of the hill, as he's taking off, he, he went to the Mount of Olives and went over the hill, and he's heading out, getting out there in the wilderness again, just like he did with Saul. When he got past the top of the hill, behold, Ziba. Now, Ziba, remember, was the servant of Saul who David sent to find an offspring of Jonathan, remember, who was Mephibosheth. Remember him? He was lame on both his feet, right? Now, Ziba is the servant who was to take care of Mephibosheth. So he comes to David, the servant of Mephibosheth, it says, met him with a couple of asses saddled and, and upon them 200 loaves of bread and a 100 bunches of raisins and a 100 of summer fruits and a bottle of wine. Ziba comes to David with a loaded set of donkeys, just loaded with fruit and food and wine and, and provision, which would have been greatly appreciated, right? The people were going to be hungry. And, and so it's appreciated. But watch this. The king, verse 2, said unto Ziba, what meanest thou by these? He doesn't really trust what Ziba's doing here right off the bat. By the way, David's first inclination here, or we might call it discernment, was accurate. He sensed something was wrong with Ziba coming to him with all this provision. Now, he doesn't do anything about it, but he senses there's something to matter. That's why I asked, what, what, what means this? See, what, what are you doing? And Ziba said, the asses be for the king's household to ride on, and the bread and summer fruit for the young men to eat, and the wine that such as be faint in the wilderness may drink. I just brought provision. I'm just being a really nice guy. David, I'm just a nice person. That's what I did this for. Hmm. The king said, and where is thy master's son? Where's Mephibosheth at? Why isn't he with you? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he abideth at Jerusalem. For he said, Today shall the house of Israel restore me the kingdom of my father. So Ziba tells David that Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, who David took in, remember, loved on him. He sat at the king's table. Ziba says, well, he stayed in Jerusalem and, and kicked me out, basically, and he wants to have the kingdom restored unto him. He thinks it's rightfully his because Saul, you know, was his grandfather. Does this sound like Mephibosheth? Mm -mm. And Ziba here is making up a story. Why? Well, he goes on. He says that this, Z, this, this Mephibosheth, Ziba says, is... You see, he's staying back to, to have the kingdom. And, and then said the king to Ziba, Well, behold, thine are all that pertain unto Mephibosheth. You can have everything that was his. Now, why does David give everything to Ziba when he probably knows good and well that there's something wrong here? This isn't right. This doesn't make sense. This doesn't add up. Why are you doing this, David? Well, I just suggest a couple of things. He's tired. He's weary. He's beaten. His son is turning on him. He's emotionally drained. He's just had it. And this now, this lie, even though it is a lie, David doesn't have the energy to deal with it. You ever feel like that? <laughs> does, does the enemy ever come at you with lies and junk? And stuff, you know it's not true, right? How many times does the enemy come to you and tell you things, and you go, oh, that's probably true? You know it's not true, right? Temptation, don't you know it's a lie? Of course you do. But do you fall for it sometimes anyway? Yep. And what do you say? What do I say when that happens? 
Oh, I was just so tired. You know, I just had a long day. I just, I was just, you know, working so hard. <laughs> you know, I hear this sometimes, you know, you, you kind of hear it from Christians that I'm just, I'm just tired. And what happens? I cave in. And being tired or being exhausted or, or just kind of having a tough time, it's a good excuse for us. It's not, a, it's not one that works. I mean, it doesn't fly, but we use it. Because it's really, listen, it's really the only thing we've got. If you don't have that, then what do you have? Well, I'm flagrantly, blatantly sinning. That's what you got. So see how much better it sounds to say, I was just so tired. Just had a hard day, you know. I just had to, I had to go there. I had to drink that. I had to buy that. I had to watch that. Whatever it is. And I'm picking on anything. Listen, it doesn't matter what it is. We have that tendency. Ah, I'm just so, I just want to veg. Does that sound familiar? Pardon me, I'm going to veg for the rest of the night, right? Why? I'm just tired. I think that's David's deal. He's just plain old tired of this fight. He's just been involved with it. His son's turned on him. His, his counselor's turned on him. Now he hears that Jonathan's own son has turned on him. I've had it. Just take what's his, you know, Zeba. Go ahead. He gives in. He caves in. Gives it all to him. And Zeba said, well, I humbly beseech thee that I might find grace in thy sight, my lord, O king. Thank you very much. Gee, I had no idea. <laughs> I had no idea you were going to give me everything. Thank you so much, you see. Now, David's only begun because now that he's given in, because he's so tired, <laughs> watch what else happens. So when King David came to uh, Behariam, behold, thence came out a man of the family of the household of Saul, whose name was Shimei, the son of Gera. He came forth and cursed still as he came. In other words, he came out cursing. Came out of the house cussing up a storm. <laughs> I've seen people like that. You, they walk out the door cussing. You know, first thing in the morning, blankety blank, 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 and then all day long, same thing. <laughs> Ever meet somebody? Me and Daniel were somewhere. Where were we? We were at the shopping center somewhere the other day. And he ran into a kid from school, you know. <laughs> and uh, I didn't hear the conversation. But Daniel informed me of it. When, <laughs> when he got in the car, he goes, Man, wow. You know, the kid only said about 10 words. Eight of them, eight of them were cuss words. And, and I'm thinking, boy, he needs to get a little vocabulary lesson. You know, he needs to expand his vocabulary. I mean, eight out of 10 words were a cuss word. And, and, and here's the thing, such were some of you and us, weren't we? Do you remember those days? I don't even like to think about it, but I was there. Amazing. And now, of course, it's like stuns you, it like shocks you. It's like somebody jolted you with one of those prodding sticks, you know. <laughs> but it never used to even bother me at all. In fact, I used to say all those words, you see. So this guy, Shimei, comes out of the house cussing at David. David, you so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. He goes on. And he casts stones at David and at all the servants of the king. <laughs> and all the people and all the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. David's there with all his mighty men. This guy's coming out of the house cussing, throwing rocks. And thus... Said Shimei, when he cursed, Come out, come out, thou bloody man. <laughs> he sounds like he's doing a nursery rhyme. Come out, come out, thou bloody man. <laughs> this, <laughs> this is his message to David. <laughs> and thou man of Belial, you devil, he says. He's calling David all kinds of names. He says, The Lord hath returned upon thee all the blood of the house of Saul. Now, he's blaming David for Saul's death. 
David didn't have anything to do with Saul's death. He wasn't even in the region. He wasn't even in the area. He says, in whose stead thou hast reigned. You took over for him. You took him out, and then you took his place. And the Lord hath delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom thy son. And behold, thou art taken in thy mischief, because thou art a bloody man. He's just railing on David. And watch this. <laughs> Abishai, verse 9, the son of Zariah. This is Joab, the general for David. This is his brother, the middle brother. And Abishai, the son of Zariah, said unto the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over, I pray thee, and take his head off. <laughs> he just wants to take care of business, you know. He, this guy comes out cussing and throwing rocks and saying all this stuff to David. And, and, and you know, <laughs> Abishai just says, let me just go take his head off. Come on, David, let me go do it. Now, this is the same guy, by the way that, you know, him and his brothers, they have this problem. Every time something happens, they want to do this. Remember? And, and this is the brother of Joab that killed Abner with Joab. They both murdered him. And so Abishai said, let me, let me take his head off. And the king said, what have I to do with you, you sons of Zariah? <laughs> Man, is this all you guys ever think about? Yep. That's, that's it. <laughs> and he says, let him curse, because the Lord has said unto him, curse David. Now, this is interesting. David wasn't responsible for Saul's death or his son's death, Ishbosheth. He wasn't responsible for any of that. So this guy's out of line there. But David understands something, that he is a bloody man. He did kill Uriah. He did do that. And this man coming out cursing, David says, no, nope, don't hurt him, leave him alone, let him go ahead and curse. Because David saw in this that he was a bloody man. And the Lord was using this as part of the rebuke for David. Remember, David was instructed that the things that he allowed, the things that he did, he was going to have to deal with them. And here, he's dealing with it. And notice what he does. He doesn't say, that's enough, I'm not dealing with this anymore. Take his head off, you know. <laughs> Shut him up permanently. He says, let him talk. Because the Lord spoke to him to rebuke me. And even though it's not pretty, it's true. I am a bloody man, David says. And he says, who shall then say, wherefore hast thou done so? In other words, he says, hey, he's... he's cursing me because the Lord said unto him, curse David. So why should I say don't do it? And David said to Abishai and to all his servants, behold, my son, which came forth of my bowels, seeketh my life. How much more now may this Benjamite do it? In other words, this guy is just kind of shouting and saying the things that my own son is doing. So, you know, should I kill him? He's just doing what my son's doing. He says, let him alone, and let him curse, for the Lord hath bidden him. Let him alone, the Lord's given him this instruction. Now that's, again, this is a point where David's growing up a bit. He realizes that this thing that's happening, that, that, that is cursing him, that's a plague to him, is something that the Lord is going to use. Watch what he says. He says, it may be, verse 12, that the Lord will look on my affliction, and that the Lord will requite me good for his cursing this day. Maybe the Lord will use this for something good, like teaching me something. Have we ever really honestly said that when things are going against us? When people are cursing you, when people are coming at you, throwing rocks at you and dirt clods, calling you names, treating you bad? Do you ever stop and go, huh, I wonder if the Lord told him to say that. What? Of course they didn't. The <laughs> Lord would never do that. The Lord's on my side. Right? The Lord's on my side. Okay. Does that mean you're never going to receive discipline from the Lord? Of course not. And David says, maybe the Lord's going to do something good with this. Like teach me not to be a bloody man anymore. 
like show me that, that the Lord's discipline is important in my life. <clears throat> now, the interesting thing is, and I'll read it to you. You can flip over there if you want. But in chapter 19, watch what happened. Chapter 19, oh, let's start in verse 16. This is after David gets, of course, back in the kingdom and everything's fine. Absalom's gone, dead. Everything's taken care of. Watch what happens. Verse 16, in Shimei. This is the guy that's been throwing rocks and dirt clods. Shimei, the son of Gera, Benjamite, which was of Barim, hasted and came down with the men of Judah to meet King David. This is when David gets back in power. And there were a thousand men of Benjamin with him. And Ziba, the servant of the house of Saul, and his 15 sons and his 20 servants were with him. And they went over Jordan before the king. And there went over a ferry boat to carry over the king's household and to do what he thought good. And Shimei, the son of Gera, fell down before the king and he, as he came over the Jordan River. This man, same guy, comes and falls down before the king as he comes back into power. And he says unto the king, Let not my lord impute iniquity unto me. Neither do thou remember that which thy servant did perversely the day that my lord the king went out of Jerusalem, that the king should take it to his heart. I didn't mean it. <laughs> Paraphrase that. I, I didn't mean, I, I, don't hold that against me. I was mad. I was angry. I, I was bent out of shape. Please don't take, you know, that too seriously. For thy servant doth know that I have sinned. Therefore, behold, I am come the first this day of all the house of Joseph to go down to meet my lord the king. But Abishai, <laughs> the son of Zariah, answered and said, Shall not Shimei be put to death for this because he cursed the Lord's anointed? There he, there he is again. Let me take his head off. <laughs> he wants to take this guy's head off. You notice that? <laughs> But watch, David says the same thing. What have I to do with you, you sons of Zariah, <laughs> that you should this day be adversaries unto me? Don't do that. Shall there be any man be put to death in this day in Israel? He says, I don't think so. For do not I know that I am this day king over Israel? Therefore the king said unto Shimei, Thou shalt not die. And the king swear unto him. Now, what David said back here in chapter 16 about maybe the Lord will work quite good to me because of this. Did he? Yep. He sure did. The same man came and said, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry I did that. And David had the blessing, the opportunity to forgive him and say it's okay. Isn't that amazing? Now, this only happens, of course, when the Lord's involved. Otherwise, guaranteed, this guy's head would have been off. You know what I mean? In, in any other scenario. And because Abishai is really trying to protect the king, and he's, he's trying to do his job, he, he has no doubt this guy deserves to die for what he's done. But David says, no, the Lord could requite me good for this thing. Everything that happens to me, David said, the Lord's probably going to use it for good. It's kind of the Romans 8.28 thing, isn't it? All things are working together for good. Even, the, even someone cursing me and throwing dirt claws at me? Yeah, it's good. And as David, verse 13, and his men went by the way, Shimei went along the hillside over against him and cursed as he went <laughs> and threw stones at him and cast dust. And the king and all the people that were with him came weary. Yeah, and refreshed themselves. There, So he moves on from there as, as Shimei is trying to follow along, throwing dust and dirt and cussing and all the rest. And it kind of brought weariness to David. He was tired, and they came and refreshed, refreshed themselves. And verse 15, And Absalom and all the people of them of Israel came to Jerusalem and Ahithophel with them. And it came to pass when uh, Hushai the archite, this is David's friend, was come unto Absalom, that Hushai said unto Absalom, God save the king, God save the king. Now this is, remember, David's friend who is going into Absalom's camp, remember, to be a spy. And listen to his words very carefully, because he's not saying anything 
that Absalom could really take as having any devotion towards Absalom at all. He says, God saved the king. God saved the king. Well, who's the king? David. <laughs> Absalom's not the king. So he says, God save the king. God save the king. David. God save the king. David. See? <laughs> and so he's, he's kind of being tricky here. But watch this. Absalom says unto Hushai, Is this thy kindness to thy friend? Why wentest thou not with thy friend? Why didn't you go with David? He's your friend. And Hushai said unto Absalom, Nay, but whom the Lord and this people and all the men of Israel choose, this I will be, and I will be with him, and I will abide with him. In other words, who the people and who the Lord chooses. Well, who's that? David. See, he's not saying he's going to be Absalom's friend or follower in any way. <laughs> And he says again, and whom should I serve? Should I not serve in the presence of his son? He's not saying I should serve his son. I serve in the presence of his son, and as I have served in thy father's presence, so will I be in thy presence. He's not pledging any loyalty to Absalom. But Absalom's ego is huge. You know, it's big, like his hair. <laughs> He's got big hair, and he's got a big ego. <laughs> and he's going to take this as if it is a loyal move on, on Hushai's part. And again, he says, I'll, I'll, I'll serve in your presence like, the, like your father's presence. Then said Absalom to Ahithophel, well, give counsel among you what we shall do. What am I supposed to do? Because we're in Jerusalem now. We're back in the city. And what should I do, Ahithophel? Counselor, And Hithophel said unto Absalom, Go into thy father's concubines, which he hath left to keep the house, and all Israel shall hear that thou art abhorred of thy father. Then shall the hands of all that are with thee be strong. So they spread Absalom a tent upon the top of the house, and Absalom went in unto his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. Now, if a king took over a kingdom... The previous king's concubines really, truly did belong to the new king. That was the way it worked in those days. But if you weren't king yet, and you went into the former king, so to speak, concubines, you were basically declaring that you're kicking the old king out, which is what he's doing here publicly. Now, interestingly, back in chapter 12, Nathan told David that this would happen. He said, verse 11, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house. Who's Absalom? His own son. And I will take thy wives, listen, before thine eyes, and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son. In other words, publicly, in front of everybody. For thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel. And before the sun. In other words, this is going to be a public humiliation that David would have to endure. And it's coming from his own household, his own son. So this is a prophetic fulfillment as well, isn't it? And Absalom's not thinking that. He's just doing this thing to cause there to be irreconcilable Differences that cannot be solved in any way, shape, or form with his father. This would do it. He would be abhorred by, in other words, there's no way to fix this once you do this. You can't, you can't take it back. You can't fix it. This will end it. So he does it. And it's interesting, same housetop where David looked down upon Bathsheba and then privately committed that adulterous act. Here, just like Nathan said, it's all in public. They set up a tent on top of his house, on David's house top. <laughs> and everybody knows what Absalom's doing. The whole place knows about it. And this is Ahithophel's advice. Why? Ahithophel can't stand David. Why? Because Bathsheba, his granddaughter, was taken advantage of by David. Where? On that house top. So he's bitter, and he wants Absalom to do this, so they... So they 
spread that tent, and Absalom does that in the sight of everybody. And the counsel of Ahithophel, which he counseled in those days, was as if a man had inquired at the oracles of God. So was all the counsel of Ahithophel, both with David and Absalom. This Ahithophel was used as a, as a means to get messages, so to speak, from God. This was not a godly message. But Absalom was using him as if he was speaking for God, and he obviously wasn't. Now, verse 1 of chapter 17, Moreover, Ahithophel said unto Absalom, Let me now choose out 12,000 men, and I will arise and pursue after David this night. This is Ahithophel's counsel. And I will come upon him while he was weary and weak-handed, and will make him afraid, and all the people that are with him shall flee. Again, he wants revenge. All he's thinking about is getting David and killing him. He says, and I will smite the king only. He only cares about killing David. That's all he cares about. He's in this for one reason. And I will bring back all the people unto thee. The man whom thou seekest is as if all returned. So all the people shall be in peace. I'll bring back everybody. They'll serve you. I'll just kill David. I just want David dead. (laughs) <laughs> That's his bitter heart, you see. And the saying pleased Absalom. It pleased him. He, he said, that sounds good. I like it. And all the elders of Israel. Now, Absalom, verse 5, is going to now call on Hushai, who's another counselor. And he, he's going to ask of him the same question as he did Ahithophel. What should we do? Now, here's the interesting thing. Ahithophel's plan would have worked. David was weary, as we read earlier. He was tired, worn out. And what Ahithophel proposed would have worked. Send a small band of guys in there, seek where David is, take him out quickly, and get out, and all the others will what? Well, they'll just come back. It would have worked, except for one thing. This is so good. Remember, we talked about what you and I ought to do when people turn on us, like Ahithophel did David, if you recall. And this is the interesting thing. Back in the previous chapter, in chapter 15, verse 31, and one told David, saying, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. He's turned on you, David, remember? And what did David do? David said, O Lord, I pray thee, turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. David prayed, Lord, make his counsel like, you know, babbling nut stuff. I mean, just make it goofy so that it doesn't make any sense. So his plan would have worked except for the Lord turned his counsel into foolishness. Watch this. Then Absalom calls Hushai, and when Hushai, verse 6, was come to Absalom. Absalom spake unto him, saying, Ahithophel had spoken after this manner. Shall we do after his saying? If not, speak thou. What do you think about Ahithophel's plan there, Hushai? Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? (laughs) And Hushai said unto Absalom, Well, the counsel that Ahithophel hath given is not good at this time. Now, notice how, you know, diplomatic he is. He says, well, you know, Ahithophel is a good counselor, but right now, this particular time, this is probably not the best counsel you could get, you know. (laughs) For said Hushai, verse 8, Thou knowest thy father and his men, that they be mighty men, and they be chaffed in their minds. They're like like wounded in their minds. they're, They're agitated, he says, as a bear robbed of her whelps in the field. You don't want to mess with a bear with those little bear cubs, you know, around. You don't mess around with a bear like that. Right, Todd? (laughs) Ask Todd about his bear bear story with the cubs. It's pretty good. (laughs) He says, and so you don't rob, you know, a, a, a bear of her whelps in the field. And thy father is a man of war and will not lodge with the people. You know him, Absalom. You know David is a man of war. And that's true. That's truth there. David was a mighty warrior. Behold, 
He is hid now in some pit or in some other place, and it will come to pass when some of them be overthrown at first that whatsoever heareth it will say, there is a slaughter among the people that follow Absalom. In other words, David's too smart to be sleeping with the men. You know your dad. He's a mighty warrior. He's going to be off somewhere hiding. And when you guys come with your little band of soldiers and get wiped out, you know what's going to happen to the whole army you have? They're going to hear of that, and they're going to head for the hills. They're going to run off. <laughs> and so, verse 10, he also that is valiant, whose heart is as the heart of a lion, shall utterly melt. All the soldiers are going to melt, for all Israel knoweth that thy father is a mighty man, and they which be with him are valiant men. So that plan isn't going to work, he says. That's just not going to work out. He says, therefore I counsel that all Israel be generally gathered unto thee from Dan even to Beersheba. Now, why does he say that? Because that's going to take some time, isn't it? He's stalling. Why? Well, we'll see here in a minute. But he wants to buy some time. And that would certainly buy time, wouldn't it? you got to get the whole army together. This is the plan. And Absalom would say, okay. But that's going to take some time. Good. That would be Hushai's response, you see. Now, go ahead, he says, and, and bring in the, 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 the soldiers from Dan, even to Beersheba, as the sand is by the sea in multitude, that thou go to battle in thine own person. You lead the battle, Absalom. Now, here's where Hushai is going to get under the skin of Absalom. Because he tells Absalom he should lead this army that's like the sand on the sea. You, Absalom, with your hair flowing, riding a white horse in front of the whole army. You know, <laughs> everybody will just be watching you, looking at you, wishing they were you. And his ego is just getting stroked here. <laughs> says, you go into battle, your own person. You go in person, you see. So shall we come upon him in some place where he shall be found, and we will light upon him as the dew falls on the ground. And of him and all of the men that are with him, there shall not be left one. In other words, we'll kill them all. Why? So that they can't turn against you later. This is the way we do it. And if he's hiding somewhere, is what he's saying, if David is hiding someplace, when you have that huge army combing the wilderness, he can't escape because there'll be too many men hunting for him. That's the way you got to do it, and you'll be leading the pack. Moreover, verse 13, if he be gotten into a city, then shall all Israel bring ropes to that city, and we will draw it into the river until there be not one small stone found there. In other words, if he goes in the city, awesome. Then we know where he's at, and the whole army goes and surrounds the city and takes it apart piece by piece. Either way, you see, either way we got him. That's his counsel. And Absalom and all the men of Israel said, the counsel of Hushai the archite is better than the counsel of Ahithophel. For the counsel, uh, uh, or for the Lord had appointed to defeat the good counsel of Ahithophel. That's true, right? David prayed, make it foolish. And he did. And Absalom doesn't even know what he's saying, but he says, well, the Lord seems to have confounded Ahithophel's counsel. Yeah, David prayed that. See, to the intent that the Lord might bring evil upon Absalom. Hey, I think Ahithophel was saying something that would bring evil to me. That's what Absalom's saying. Maybe Ahithophel doesn't know as much as he says he does. So it worked. You see, the Lord did it. Then said Hushai unto Zadok and unto Abiathar, the priest. Now remember, back in the story, David had told these two, remember? The sons of the priests, you guys go, take the ark back. Remember, they came with the ark when David was fleeing Jerusalem. And David said, no, take it back. Take it back where it belongs, and you guys go back with it. And then you listen in to what's going on, and you can come tell me. So here it is. Watch this. Abiathar and Zadok, the priests, they did hear the counsel of Ahithophel and Absalom and his elders of Israel. And thus and thus have I counseled. In other words, they've heard all the, the word that, that was spoken. Now, therefore, sin quickly and tell David. 
saying, Lodge not this night in the plains of the wilderness, but speedily pass over, lest the king be swallowed up and all the people that are with him. So the words back to the priests, and they are now going to send out their sons to go warn David, just like it was planned, you see. Now Jonathan in Ahimaaz stayed in Enrogo, for they might not be seen to come into the city. And a wench went and told them, and they went and told King David. Nevertheless, a lad saw them and told Absalom, but they went, both of them, away quickly and came to a man's house in Bairam, which had a well in his court, whither they went down. They climbed down the well. Good place to hide. And the woman, this woman who, who took them in, took and spread and co- a covering over the well's mouth and spread ground corn thereon, and the thing was not known. In other words, she just kind of threw this tarp over the, the well and then poured a bunch of corn out all over the tarp. So it just looked like it was a place for drying corn. I mean, who's going to dig through a bunch of corn, lift a tarp to see if there's a well under there, right? So that's where they are. They're down in the well. Climb down inside there. So they're hiding in there, and, and uh, when Absalom's servants came, verse 20, the woman uh, of the house said, well, they said, where is Ahimaaz and Jonathan? And the woman said unto them, they be gone over the brook of water. This sounds like Rahab and the spies, doesn't it? They, they, went, they went that away, is what she says. And, and they had sought and could not find them. They looked around, couldn't find them anywhere, and they returned to Jerusalem. And it came to pass, after they were departed, that they came up out of the well and went and told King David and said unto David, Arise and pass quickly over the water, for thus hath Ahithophel counseled against you. Now David hears that Ahithophel has counseled all this against him. Then David arose, verse 22, and all the people that were with him, and they passed over Jordan by the morning light. There lacked not one of them that was not gone over Jordan. So they escaped, getting out of the place where Absalom's going to bring his whole army. But now they've crossed over the Jordan. They're not even in the area where Absalom would think of going, you see. And watch this. And when Ahithophel saw that his counsel was not followed, he saddled his ass and arose and got him home to his house, to his city, put his household in order, and hanged himself and died and was buried in the sepulcher of his father. So Ahithophel, this counselor, realizes that his counsel did not get heeded. Now, why did he go hang himself? Well, he's serving the wrong king isn't he? And when King David, and he knows his counsel would have worked, but because Hushai's counsel is being heeded, he knows that David is going to be victorious now. And he knows he's going to be put to death. He's a traitor, right? He, he turned, you see. He, he, he was doing fine with David, but then what happened? Bitterness set in. He couldn't get over what David had done earlier in his life. And that bitterness is what caused him then to fall. And I need to say this. This is something that happens so often with people. Something took place in in my life. Something took place in your life. And it may be a while back. And you might think you're doing fine until all of a sudden you realize you are bitter about that. And this will get you, folks. Bitterness will get you. It'll take you down, just like it did Ahithophel. You think you're doing okay. He was David's counselor. We would say he's his best friend. But listen carefully. Bitterness, listen, bitterness knows no friendship and knows no family. Bitterness will ruin a family. It'll ruin a friendship. It'll ruin a church. It'll ruin lives, period. Bitterness. This thing that creeps into your heart and festers and turns into like, you know, uh, an infected sore that gets, you know, worse and worse and worse. And before long, it's this huge looking green boil. Just, did I ever tell you about my boil? I had? It was awesome. 
I was probably nine. I was like nine years old, and I was down at my the elementary school, Daniel Freeman Elementary School in Inglewood, California. You know, you don't want to get within about five miles of that school now. But I grew up there, and I played baseball like all the time. I mean, I love baseball. I played baseball every day down at the schoolyard, right? And I played baseball so much during this one season that my hand was just getting beat up, even though I had my baseball mitt on. And I remember I, I, I developed a blister right in the middle of the palm of my hand, you know. And I'm playing baseball, and that blister grew and got big and then popped, you know, like blisters do. You know, no big deal. You peel the skin off. It's a little sore, stings a bit. And I'm still playing baseball with my grimy, sweaty baseball mitt, right? Play all afternoon. Go home, probably didn't wash my hands. Boys did that. You ever notice that? I had to take a bath every Saturday night, whether I needed it or not. My mom would make me, <laughs> she would make me get in the bathtub. I hated that. I had all this great built up dirt and she wanted to wash it all off, you know, get that off of there, Ugh. you know. And bo guys, were, boys were just that way, you know, just, and I sometimes just see boys and you go, dude, you know, wow. <laughs> the boys don't care, you know. So anyway, I had this thing. I probably didn't wash my hand or whatever. Anyway, this thing gets infected, right? And it's starting to get sore. A couple of days go by. It's starting to get more and more painful. And I'm thinking, oh, boy, you know. And all of a sudden, it starts rising. And the next day, it's even bigger. It's starting to look like a mountain in my hand. And, you know, after about three days, my mom notices it, and she goes, uh, what is that, you know? Because, because at this point, I can't even close my hand. You know, it's getting to that point, you know? And so my mom says, well, that doesn't get better by tomorrow. Well, tomorrow came, and this thing looking like Mount Vesuvius. I mean, it's green and purple looking, and... And it's killing, I mean, you can't breathe on this thing, right? You know, you know what I'm talking about. It's like a, like a, a boil that's gone on steroids. It's just this ugly thing. So my mom says, we got to go to the doctor. And I'm like, no way. Put a hot compress on it or something. But no doctor. She said, oh, we got to go to the doctor. That thing is nasty. So sure enough, we got to go to the doctor. And the doctor, he looks at that thing and goes, wow, you know, you're in trouble when the doctor uses language like that. <laughs> when the doctor says, wow, it's like, oh, man. And he brings somebody else in there to look at it with him. You know what I mean? He says, I'll be right back. And then he brings another guy in. They, wow. You know, it's like, a, you know, a specimen or something. <laughs> and so he sits there and looks at it and goes, Okay, well, we got to do something about that. And I'm like, yeah, I was afraid of that, you know. And I said, well, what are you going to do? And I turn around just for a second, and I look back, and he's got a needle. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. Like that. And I said, what are you going to do with that? <laughs> he said, well, I've got I've to stick that in. Uh-uh. I mean, you, I mean, seriously, you couldn't even touch me up here. You know, on, the, on my arm, it hurt so bad. And he said, I got I to do this. I said, oh, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> with screaming and tears and, you know, they tied me down and all the rest, he sticks that thing right at the base of that big, humongous thing and <laughs> starts injecting something in there. And I'm not kidding you, it was the most awesome thing. The whole top of that thing blew off like a volcano. <laughs> it was like gushing green stuff and just all over. It just looked like, um, you know, wow. And if it wasn't so painful, I would have really enjoyed it more. But it was the coolest thing, and um, wow, where was I going with that? Where was I, anyway? 
<laughs> wow. Oh, bitterness. <laughs> That's what bitterness is like. It, <laughs> it turns into this big, ugly thing that eventually is just going to blow up and it's ugly, and it's just green, and it's yucky, and this is the thing. This, and Ahithophel, he was so consumed with this bitter heart that it really just took him down. And, and watch this now. Psalm 33, verse 10. David says, The Lord bringeth the counsel of the heathen to naught. He maketh the devices of the people of none effect. The counsel of the Lord standeth forever, the thoughts of his heart to all generations. David said, you know, Ahithophel's counsel came to nothing, and his bitterness was just consuming him. And he hung himself much like Judas, who betrayed Jesus, did. Do you know Judas wasn't, he wasn't repentant when he betrayed Jesus. He was bitter. The reason he betrayed Jesus was because of bitterness. He was never really one of his in the first place. He never really believed. He never really wanted to walk with Jesus. He was a bitter man. He, he was greedy. He wanted to hold the purse, remember? He wanted to get into the money bag all the time. And he betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And people say, well, well he, he, he took him back. He took him back. Then he went and hung himself. Now, people say, well, wasn't that because he felt so bad? And this is, the, this is the thing. Do you think Ahithophel felt bad? Probably. He probably felt bad that his plan didn't work. Judas knew the same thing Ahithophel did. Uh-oh. I just turned on the king. And I don't have a chance. Now, could he have repented? He could have. Could Ahithophel have repented? Yes. Do you think that if Ahithophel would have gone to David and said, man, I really blew it, do you think David would have forgave him? Yeah. But you see, the bitter heart of Ahithophel, like Judas, wasn't into repentance, wasn't into forgiveness. Peter puts it this way. Godly sorrow leads to repentance. Regular sorrow or being sorry that didn't work out or what it, that doesn't lead to repentance. If it doesn't lead to repentance, then it wasn't godly sorrow that you felt or experienced. That always will lead to repenting. And this is something that I need to understand, you do too, that feeling bad about doing something or, or that is not proof that you've repented. <laughs> People say, Well, I felt real rotten about sinning. Yeah. So that means I've done something right, huh? No. Just means you feel lousy. Sin makes you feel that way. What, it, what have you done? Have you repented from it? Have you turned from it? That's the question. Because just because you feel lousy about sin, and this is something we've, we've touched on before, and it's really key even as we get ready to go to the table tonight, and that is this. When you go to the Lord and say, Oh, Lord, I'm so sorry I sinned. Do you do so because you feel lousy and you want to feel better? Or because you really feel and are convinced that your sin has grieved the Lord? That's a tough question because oftentimes the answer is this. I feel crummy. I want to feel better. So I'll just ask the Lord to, you know, take care of that for me. Lord, make me feel better. I'm sorry. I sin. That's not necessarily godly sorrow. And the re reason you can know that or not know it is whether or not repentance has come. Have I really turned from that? You see, or not. And people say, well, I did repent. I did, really. But I got caught up in it again. That's okay. Listen carefully. Struggling over sin is one thing. But never repenting over something is a different issue which is where some people go. That's where they live. And feeling bad about sin, hey, that doesn't mean you've turned from it. It just means you feel crummy about it. And asking the Lord to deal with that part of 
your feelings or, or the way you're dealing with it isn't necessarily asking for the right thing. In fact, as I've mentioned before, sometimes the prayer needs to be, Lord, you need to hit me harder with this one. You need to get, you need to get this through to, to, to this heart because I'm not, I'm not doing it. I'm feeling bad about it, but all I'm really seemingly caring about is not feeling bad about it anymore, you see. Instead of saying, Lord, this grieved your heart, this, 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 this was against you. I sinned against you, as David said, and you alone have I sinned against. It's not, not that I feel bad. I can feel bad. I can feel crummy. That, hey, I'm supposed to about sin. If I don't feel bad about sin, I never, never do anything about it. I'm supposed to feel that way. Well, not always, are you? No. But I'll tell you what. If you repent from something, I'll tell you what happens. You do feel better. But not because, listen, not because the Lord's just released you from the feeling, but has restored you into that intimacy again, which is what you're really longing for. But don't just seek to feel better. And, and don't seek to feel better too quickly. You know, we're into this instant age. You know, it's kind of like drive through forgiveness. You know, <laughs> and I've said it before, but if you could figure out a way for people to get through a drive through at 40 miles an hour, you'd make a billion dollars. Right? If you didn't even have to slow down the car to get the food from the window into my seat of my car. If you could figure out a way to do it at 40 miles an hour, you'd be rich. Because we don't like to wait. And some of us don't like to wait to feel better. So that becomes the focus for us. And that's not necessarily the key. The key is, have I repented? And if I haven't, I don't need to feel better about this. Do you understand? In fact, I need to experience the weight of it until I've repented. Then, ah, restored, you see. Now I know. I've turned from that. And the Lord says, now, now we can have this intimacy again. So he hung himself and was buried there. And then David came to Manaheim, and Absalom passed over Jordan, he and all the men of Israel with him. And Absalom made Amasa captain of the host instead of Joab, which Amasa was a, uh, a man's son whose name was uh, Ethra an Israelite that went to Abigail, the daughter of Nahash, sister to Zariah, Joab's mother. So Israel and Absalom pitched in the land of Gilead, and it came to pass when David was come to Manaheim that Shobi, the son of Nahash, of Reba, of the children of Ammon, and Maker, the son of Amiel, of Lodabar, and Brazili, the Gileadite, of Rogelium, bought beds and basins and earthen vessels and wheat and barley and flour and parched corn and beans and lentils and parched pulse, whatever that is, and honey and butter and sheep and cheese of kind for David and for the people that were with him to eat, for they said the people is hungry and weary and thirsty in the wilderness. This is interesting. The people began to bring David provision. In other words, those that were really behind David started showing it by supporting him in this way. It's interesting. I find a parallel here in Psalm 23, where David, remember, penned that psalm. And he said that the Lord hath prepared a table for me in the presence of my enemies. And I believe perhaps this was one of the, the thoughts David may have had when he penned that, that in the presence of his enemies. They are surrounded. Absalom's men are all around, and yet these people have come, and the Lord has led them there to bring all this wealth of food and supply to David while he's there in the wilderness, hurting, you see. And the Lord prepared a table for him right there. That's such an awesome thing. The Lord can deal with wherever you're at with plenty of provision, plenty of security, plenty of whatever you need, in the midst of your enemies, in the midst of the problem. And this is something I wish I could learn more, that, that it's not getting out of the situation that is necessarily the key, 
but actually seeing that the Lord prepares a table, prepares things for me in the midst of it, right there with my enemies all around. That's where you really start to see, hey, if this is truly, if this is what the Lord's doing in my life right now, and he's going to give me peace and rest and joy and provision in the midst of this, is that okay with me? Yeah, I'm okay with that. I have to be, because in reality, folks, everywhere we go, anything we're a part of, anything we're doing in this world, we're going to have the enemy around us constantly. And it's the peace we get in the midst of adversity that really counts, isn't it? If you can be at peace, even though everything seemingly is crumbling around you, what does it matter? What does it matter that everything's falling apart if you're at peace, right? If you have abundant joy, peace, your gladness, all does it really matter what's happening? Not really. This is where David was experiencing the peace and the rest and the supply that God was giving, and he was okay with it. He was, he was satisfied, you know. And I alluded to it in the prayer that I prayed before we got started, that, that Jason, you know, had this amazing peace in the midst of his hardest time in the hospital, you know. And for, for most of us, this would be the, the worst thing, you know, to be laying there without being able to move, with tubes down your throat and up your nose and, and, and not being able to breathe, not being able to cough. Not, I mean, you want to talk about messing with your mind. Now, and this is something that, that when people say, hey, what's the deal with you Christians? You know, why do you want to have this relationship with the Lord? Let me tell you why. You get in a position like that, and you can lose your mind. You know, I mean, most people would, would say, hey, you know, the worst thing that could ever happen is, you know, you, you wake up and you've been buried alive. You know that feeling? What would you do? You would lose your mind, right? But let me tell you something. Let me just give you a little secret about the peace of God. If you woke up and you've been buried alive and you can't move, <laughs> you can't, I mean, talk about claustrophobia, man, Right? You're going crazy just hearing that, aren't you? Doesn't it just make you go, let me out of here? <laughs> you just want to stretch your legs a little bit, don't you? Okay, can I move? You say, now, <laughs> here's the thing. If that position to be in, the worst thing you could possibly imagine, if you had peace, rest, joy in that position, it wouldn't matter. That is what God can give. And let me tell you, if you've ever been in that kind of position where you are experiencing that kind of anxiety and don't have the peace of God, those people, those people are in wards and they never came back. They lost their mind. See ya checked out. Why? No peace. No rest. No joy. Now, when someone says, why do you want to be a Christian? Well, that's a good reason right there for me. You know, call me silly, but let me tell you something. When life gets that hard and you can have peace in the midst of it, then I'll tell you what, you'll know why you have a relationship with God. You'll know. And that is something you can't buy, you can't explain it to people. You, and, and all I can say, you know, and me and Jason talked about this, what would, what would people do in this? What do they do without Jesus? He goes, I have no idea. I have no idea. And the reality is they, they don't. They don't make it. See you around. They just, they're gone. Just, wow, can't deal with it. The peace of God that passes understanding, that goes beyond the reasoning. Goes, I mean, because people say, well, he can't be at peace in that position. Yes, he was. And even in the midst of his enemies, the Lord set a table before him. And in the darkness of night, he felt the enemy come, feeling like he was trying to take him out. But God had other plans. See, he gave him the peace and rest. That's the deal, guys. That's what David had that Absalom didn't have. That's what David had that Ahithophel didn't have. 
That's what the disciples had that Judas didn't have. Just makes you toss it in. Forget it. I, I can't deal with life. I can't deal with any of this. I, I'm, I'm, I'm out of here. I can't, you know, I'll try and figure out a way to disguise it or, or deaden it or, or numb it or something because I can't deal with it. And most of us know that. Most of us who've done the drugs, who've been there, who, who did the, the party scene, trying to deaden and numb life so we wouldn't have to feel it, right? The peace of God that passes understanding replaces that in such a profound way that you can't even explain it to people. But boy, I'm glad I have it. See, this is kind of the rubber meets the road theology. You know what I mean? Or D.L. Moody used to say, let's put some shoe leather on that doctrine. You know? <laughs> yeah, let's, get, let's get right down to it and let's see if we can walk that out. See if we can get some reality checks going. Because I'll tell you, you get in a fix like that, you don't know Jesus, you're in trouble. You do? You could have peace. And rest and joy. I tell you what, I saw Jason today. He's got a twinkle in his eye. He's ready to go. Kind of amazing, don't you think? Kind of awesome. What a God we have. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the word that speaks to us. And Lord, the way that you are able to bring peace in the midst of the hard things of life the heavy anxiety, Father, that can encompass us. You're able to set a table for us right there where, where there's not only just ability to cope, but there's peace. There's, there's a, a, a rest, a joy that's beyond anything that we could possibly imagine. And Father, I thank you for the reality of that. I've experienced it, Lord. I've had peace in the midst of the worst times. I've had you hold me like a little baby when I was unable to cope with anything. And Lord, you've, you've given me strength in the midst of utter weakness. And you've been my God when I didn't have any resource or any recourse left. So, Lord, I thank you for that. I thank you for the story that, that David experienced and the things that he went through that we can learn from. I thank you that you're faithful. I thank you, Lord, for just being there for us. If we'll cry out and call upon you, you're right there. You're faithful. We love you. We honor you. And we want to come to the table tonight, Lord. And again, may we not do this just to feel better, but, Lord, truly to give ourselves over to you once again in confessing our sin. And Lord, if we need to feel the weight of that sinfulness upon us in order for us to repent and turn from it, then Lord, may that be so. I pray that we would just come and, and truly, Lord, do business tonight at your table, knowing that you're faithful and just to cleanse us from all that iniquity and all that junk, if we will truly confess it, which means we agree with you that it's sin. It's not okay. It's not something that we ought to be a part of. Thanks for your sacrifice on the cross, which is pictured here, which is represented here in the bread and the cup. We remember what you did, Jesus. We thank you for it. We place the highest value on it. We lay this time before you, Father. Bless the communion table. Bless our our time of worship be honored again. And may we just come before you with our hope, hearts opened and our, our hearts willing to receive again as we turn to you once more. Bless us indeed, in Jesus' name. Amen. Until the 
Shall come. 